questions at the very end. If you stay around, then you can answer, ask some of those. But I get to introduce Franz Rod, uh, uh, who is a professor of civil engineering here at uh, Portland State. He's been here for 39 years. Uh, 23 years of that, he was department head. Uh, and he's had many publications, over 85 technical publications that he's been, and also many, many research grants that he's either been uh, PI or co-PI on. He's been president of the Structural Engineers Association of Oregon. He has been president of the American Concrete, in Concrete Institute here in, uh, in Oregon. He is a registered uh, civil engineer and structural engineer. He's a fellow and life member of the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers. He's a fellow of the American Concrete Institute, a life member of the Structural Engineers Association. And I would like to welcome Franz Rod, and he is going to take us to seismic vulnerability of Portland's buildings. Franz, all yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Scott. I, I, th I think I kind of like this, uh, this too, uh, as opposed to the lavalier. Uh, see if I can uh, work with my left hand here and hold, hold the mic. Okay, uh, so this is going to be uh, a talk on buildings. So we know uh, about the geology, seismology, and the fact that we will have uh, large earthquakes. So the uh, challenge that uh, we had some years ago was uh, to take a look at uh, what would happen to the buildings uh, in the Portland metropolitan area. Uh, so we decided then to um, go ahead and uh, do um, a seismic vulnerability uh, assessment. And that took uh, about 10 years, by the way. Uh, and uh, so the fundamental question really is, uh, uh, what kind of models are we going to use? Uh, uh, that uh, would give us a realistic analysis of how these uh, structures are going to perform. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, you know, what can we do in our laboratories, uh, in our, uh, on, on our various campuses, um, do some experimental res research, uh, trying to help uh, structural engineers uh, better design. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, what we call the SHEAR, uh, that's uh, Seismic Hazard Evaluation and Research. So this program that we started some 15 years ago um, had rapid visual surveys, uh, seismic hazard evaluation modeling, that's a computer model. Uh, we had hazards modeling, then structural component behavior, um, testing, these are experimental tests that we ran, and then improving buildings uh, by retrofitting them. So that was another study that we uh, undertook. So I will probably just quickly go through these things because I've given everybody 15 or 18 minutes, so uh, I, it's not going to be super technical, but uh, uh, I have a lot of slides that I can go through. Um, so let's take a look at um, what is the meaning of uh, the evaluation modeling. And that is, uh, in a sort of a simple terminology, uh, study of potential earthquake damages to buildings and other infrastructural systems. Uh, so that is what we are trying to find out. Uh, what would be the damages or the damage based on a particular uh, peak ground acceleration, PGAs. So how do we do this then? Well, learning from past earthquakes uh, is number one, determining the critical characteristics of the structures and the underlying soils and how they're going to impact uh, the behavior. Uh, assess the probability of damage based on statistical information uh, that we have gathered over many, many decades uh, from various earthquakes. Uh, and then the, probably the most important part of it is gather expert opinions. So these would be uh, structural designers, geotechnical uh, engineers, seismologists, and so on uh, that can pass judgment uh, on what these uh, potential damages are going to be. And then develop computer models. So that is the overall assessment of uh, how you go about doing uh, seismic uh, hazard evaluation. So uh, learning from past earthquakes, um, uh, that was uh, really one of the, one of the areas that uh, um, you have heard about and uh, Scott Burns talked about it uh, tonight. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. Uh, I just want to show you um, the various um, quakes that have happened that have been at the forefront of the media over the last uh, maybe three or four decades. 
So there is the San Fernando, um, there is the Mexico City earthquake, uh, this is the Loma Prieta earthquake, so most of you probably still remember some of these earthquakes, um, 94, Northridge earthquake, we learned a lot. So these are some samples, this is really a small sample of the quakes that we have uh, studied, uh, we have had reconnaissance reports on, uh, and uh, we can uh, then gauge how these earthquakes have damaged various structures and bridges uh, and the lifeline and uh, other types of infrastructure uh, that hopefully we're going to get a chance to talk about some more. Okay, so this is the Izmit uh, Kochegli uh, earthquake, 7.4. Again, uh, world earthquakes, we have uh, lots and lots of examples. This is one uh, that uh, attracted a lot of attention, 17, over 17,000 uh, people died there. Uh, this is the Taiwan earthquake, uh, about 2,500 died, uh, lots and lots of billions of dollars that uh, was lost. This is uh, the BAM earthquake, 35,000 people died there. Uh, this is the 2003, the 2004 that everybody remembers, the Indian Ocean earthquake, uh, two, over 225,000 people that died uh, in that quake. Uh, this is the Haiti, uh, 230,000 people that died. Again, samples of the quakes that we learned from. This is the Chile earthquake of uh, 2010. Uh, again, uh, this is, I, I just wanted to uh, show you a little quick example uh, related to the Chile earthquake, and maybe some of the other speakers are gonna uh, make a reference to it as well. But since 1973, there have been 13 events of magnitude seven or greater so that particular country is quite used to having a lot of earthquakes so their policies uh, and the way they have retrofitted their structures and the way they design their structures uh, would be compatible with um, the, the frequency of these types of earthquakes uh, and consequently when you uh, look at uh, what happened there this is uh, one short slide of uh, a reconnaissance report uh, the failure of three plus story buildings was only half a percent. The failure of nine plus story buildings was uh, less than three percent. So um, that's good news. That's good news. Uh, again, because of the frequency, because uh, the weaker structures are purged uh, and uh, they have strengthened their building codes and their policies for buying and selling uh, buildings, uh, that has really helped. This is something that we don't have uh, in, in Oregon. We don't have it in Portland. Um, okay, so moving uh, towards uh, today, uh, that would be the 2011 Christchurch, Christchurch New Zealand earthquake, 6.3. Again, uh, you can see some of the stats over there. Uh, at least 166 people that died, 240 missing, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the Tohoku earthquake, the uh, the most recent one uh, that um, uh, I think everybody remembers, that was uh, just this past March. Uh, and so, uh, again, past earthquakes that can teach us how to do our job better. Uh, the other aspect of uh, uh, this whole process of evaluation and retrofitting and understanding what to do in the future has to do with building codes. And the effect of building codes is really twofold. One is, uh, well, when was this structure built? Uh, was it 50 years ago? Was it 80 years ago? Was it only 10 years ago? What was the prevailing building code at the time the structure was built? The second part of the uh, attribute is, what is today's building code? And how is this structure that is still there after 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or 60 years, how is this structure compares uh, to the current building code? knowing that the current building code is a uh, lot more accurate in terms of prediction of damages and so on. So we look at building codes, past and present, because of these two reasons. Very important. So we want to go back now, and uh, Scott Burns already mentioned to you uh, something about the old building codes. Uh, so he said when he came here, uh, you know, the building code was weak. Uh, well, when I came here before he did, uh, the building code was really, really weak. Uh, and so these are the, uh, the, the, this is basically the UBC, the, the Uniform Building Code map uh, that uh, prevailed in those days. And uh, unfortunately, thousands of structures were built 
based on the weak and imperfect uh, building code. And so now we have to live with these buildings. This is a little bit more recent, probably 15 years ago, where UBC code improved. Um, uh, I remember I was the, uh, heading the Structural Engineer Association of Oregon, and we had to work with seismologists, try to go from 2B to 3, and that took us about four years of effort, maybe more than that, maybe five or six years. Modern codes, of course, are quite different in their approach. This is uh, 2006 IBC. Now we're going to be looking at the probabilistic methodology for design. It's a lot more accurate and hopefully a lot more precise as well in uh, giving us uh, the guidelines and the rules that we need to follow uh, in making our designs, our structural design, infrastructure design, um, better uh, and more long-lasting. So uh, then the other question that I raised with you a few minutes ago was, okay, if, it, if a design was based on a building code that is 40 years old or 50 years old, how does that fare now uh, based on the new understanding of seismology, new understanding of building behavior and structural design? How does, that, uh, how does that compare? Well, here is a graph. I mean, it took us uh, probably a couple of years to uh, come up with this graph, but this is a simplified version of the results of our research. And that shows you um, on the vertical axis the percent of today's code. As you can see, the today's code, by the time you got to something like 2000, 2005, and so on, is essentially at 100% of today's code. And uh, we are here. This, you see that on the right side uh, of the screen. And then uh, if you go down to uh, maybe buildings that were 25 years um, ago that were built based on the then current codes. So if you go back to, say, mid-80s, you can see the capacity of these buildings is only about 50% of what they should be uh, based on today's understanding of seismology and what we can expect in Portland. Uh, so that kind of gives you a clue, hopefully a graphic clue, uh, that uh, most of the structures, and I would venture to guess, it's probably more like 90% of the structures, probably fit that category, uh, that their capacity based on today's understanding of the building code is about 50%. Now that exhausts all factors of safety, essentially, that we may have uh, in our building construction and uh, building design. So the question then is, how are we going to then perform this seismic hazard evaluation for Portland? Uh, we decided to go with the Applied Technology Council, that's ATC 21. That is a simplified version, uh, a lot simpler than, say, ASC 31, uh, which is a lot more involved in its evaluation. But we wanted to spend maybe about an hour, uh, and that was done mostly by grad students. And we wanted to go and survey uh, buildings, uh, commercial buildings, anything that is not residential, uh, single family home or duplex, we left those guys out. But um, uh, by the time we got to a triplex or fourplex, uh, and then we got into multi-story structures, uh, then we wanted to cover all of these buildings and do an ATC 21 uh, survey. So uh, quickly, ATC 21 basically looks at what type of uh, building you have and what are what we call the performance modification factors. In other words, those are the factors that are going to detract from the capacity and the performance uh, of these buildings. So we take a look at that. We look at the wood buildings. We look at the steel frame with concrete shear walls. We kind of catalog these based on the ductility and their competence uh, against uh, earthquake damage. Uh, concrete moment frames, concrete shear walls, uh, concrete tilt-up, concrete precast, on reinforced masonry, reinforced masonry, uh, RMs, uh, those are the ones that have rebars in them. Uh, and then we look at these modification factors, like uh, are they irregular? Do they have torsional components? Do they have vertical irre irregularities? Uh, and then we look at the soil profile. The soil profile, of course, that we use came straight from Dogami. Uh, and so we utilize their soil data to incorporate in our computer model. And then we looked at the structural falling hazard. Those are the uh, brick veneers, uh, the chimneys, and so on, the parapets that can fall down and injure people. Then we looked at the occupancy, how many people actually uh, potentially are in these buildings and at what time. So we had to do a little bit of guesstimation and maybe talk to the owners uh, and uh, get as much data as we could. 
And then, of course, there are ATC 21 forms. So the grad student would go in there, take a picture, maybe talk to a couple of people, do some walking measurements, and then uh, do uh, basically uh, tag the various uh, numbers uh, and words on this matrix of data sheet. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the background to this comes from another Applied Technology Council publication, that's ATC 13, where there is actually a performance score that is associated with these types of buildings. Uh, and the basis of the score is basically what we call a damage factor, which is the dollars that are lost divided by the replacement value. So it gives you a percentage, basically, or a fraction. Uh, and then the score itself is uh, the reciprocal of the log of the probability of this damage factor exceeding 60%. So this is the expert opinion uh, that was published uh, so many, many, well, maybe about 20 years ago now, uh, that by the time you get to 60%, then the question is, is this structure going to be uh, retrofitted, uh, repaired, or is it going to basically be raised and eliminated and maybe build a new one uh, in its place? So this would be then uh, a, a relationship between this damage factor that we talk about and the structural score. So the higher the score, the better the structure. Uh, and the lower the score, of course, the worse it is going to perform. So this particular one is for the tilt-up. Of course, we had to generate these for all different types of uh, structures. So we have the inventory on the right, on the top. Then we have the ground motion. Then we have the direct damage. So that would be the building stock, the lifeline, and so on. And then on top of that, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands there are other types of damages as well, such as induced damage. So that would be fire, debris, and others direct economic and social losses, and so on. Uh, and we did not, in our investigation, we did not do the induced, we did not do the direct economic damages, and so on. So we only did the direct damage, building stock. And so the damages that we are going to talk about really only relate to the first block after, the, uh, after we get the inventory and we get the ground motion. Um, OK, so how do we then apply this computer model to, uh, say, Portland? Uh, well, first of all, let me say that we had over 50,000 buildings that we surveyed, and that's why it took us about 10 years. We did the entire uh, Portland metropolitan area, the, the, the growth boundary. And then as, a, as an example, uh, we chose the USGS seven and a half minute, and that's the one that, if you can detect it, I can't point to it here, the one that says Portland. It's the Portland Quad. So we selected that because it did include downtown and so on. And that one had uh, 7,690 commercial buildings. We had the data from ATC 21. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was to evaluate the vulnerability of these buildings as a sample. We had a lot of GIS work that we had to do. Uh, and as you can see, there are many, many different kinds of buildings that are included within this uh, roughly 8,000 buildings, commercial buildings. Uh, again, uh, single family residential and duplexes are excluded from our investigation. Uh, lots of different types of buildings, uh, different configurations. Some of them uh, next to others with pounding problems existed. Even at Portland State, which was included in our investigation, you can see there are lots of different varieties. Here's Hoffman Hall, uh, more modern, uh, school of business, library, uh, and so on and so forth. So we had lots and lots of buildings, well, in this case, 7,700 roughly, that we wanted to investigate uh, and uh, put into our computer model to see what we would expect uh, from uh, what the seismologists tell us in terms of the peak ground acceleration coming through uh, because of the subduction quake. So the results then are shown basically graphically here. Uh, so we're looking at uh, all different types of buildings that are within uh, this growth boundary. And of course, we are also be concentrating on the, on the Portland Quad uh, for our further analysis. These are the, uh, the URMs. Uh, these are the unreinforced masonry uh, buildings. Uh, those are the, probably the worst offenders uh, in terms of uh, quake performance. Uh, and the final results are given to you here in terms of the average scores and probably the one that you want to look at would be the URMs. You can see how uh, the scores are. Remember, the higher the score, the better they're going to perform. 
And so those are the areas in millions of square feet, the number of buildings uh, that are shown and what type of buildings they are uh, and what the score uh, for uh, these types of buildings turns out to be. So we're looking at it sort of like a macroscopic view of it. Uh, these are based on occupancies, uh, you know, how many of them are public assemblies, how many of them are schools, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, here are the summary of losses. Uh, so again, we're looking at building types, uh, what the definition uh, is for each one of them, the total loss of life. Uh, down below, you can see it's more like 13,000, roughly. Uh, this includes all the modifiers, by the way. Uh, and we compare this to Kobe uh, in terms of the percent damage to structures, and we could see uh, some degree of comparability uh, with Kobe, and Kobe being somewhat similar to Portland, and perhaps the PGA is, on the average, was about the same. Uh, our study shows uh, the Portland Quad, and then, of course, the Kobe city is next to it. You can see we got about 10.2 percent, they got about 12.6 percent, uh, 50 percent or more uh, probability of damage. Uh, so here would be then uh, to look at what would be then uh, if we retrofit these structures that are the worst offenders, what would be the cost benefit analysis? So we can identify weaker buildings and decide to retrofit or purge them. So if you don't want to retrofit them, re retrofit them then you basically eliminate them. And we came up with uh, basically this system uh, this is, would be what we call the retrofit prioritization system. Again, this is the same 7,700 commercial buildings. Uh, the benefits in billions of dollars, the net benefit would be what you spend uh, is subtracted from the benefit, so that would be the net benefit, however you want to look at it, uh, comparable numbers. And as you can see here, um, the net benefit or the benefit it goes up and then it kind of levels down or levels off by the time you get to about a billion dollars. Uh, so if you look at the efficiency, and the efficiency of the system is defined as uh, really the gain that you have, and the gain is uh, the losses that you are avoiding when the quake happens. Uh, and then uh, what you put into the system is the retrofit cost. Uh, and so as you can see, we have uh, down below, you can see the net benefit is about $28 billion for a billion dollars of expenditure. Uh, to retrofit the worst offenders. So it's a 28 to 1. I've kind of rounded that off to about 30 to 1. Uh, building types with optimal retrofit groups. You can see the steel, concrete, this is out of the 7,700 buildings. And you can see again the URM, the unreinforced masonry, way down below is 591 of these guys that had to be retrofitted uh, because uh, they're going to kill people, right? Uh, these are the percent of the buildings. Again, you can look at all these st statistics to see how many of what type of structures are going to be incorporated into this. Again, if you look at the URM, you can see uh, almost 69% uh, of those buildings are going to be incorporated into this retrofit uh, uh, suggestion or recommendation. Uh, retrofit cost is about, a, this is rounded off numbers, by the way. Retrofit cost is a billion, net benefit is 30. Benefit to cost is about 30. Number of buildings to be retrofitted is 1,000. Uh, building damages avoided is about 0.65. You can see that number is low. The reason for that is because we have assigned $2.2 million per life saved. $2.2 million for per life saved. And that has been a number that traditionally has been used. So the lives that we have saved is 12,700. Uh, now, there is also variational studies, or parametric studies, that we have done, and uh, this shows you what happens if those modifiers are eliminated. In other words, none of the buildings is really in poor condition, none of the buildings has torsional effects, none of the buildings has vertical irregularities, none of the buildings is a bad building, okay? So that would be the right column, no modifiers, uh, and you can see the lives that are lost in that case drops down from 13,000 down to 3,100. 3, uh, but if you look at the second row, you can see the value of life that was assigned was 2.2 million, and you can see the efficiency was 30, right, in the first column. Now, what happens to the efficiency if no modifiers exist, which is a kind of a dreamlike kind of a thing, that all buildings are really good buildings? Then the efficiency drops to seven. Now, what happens if you value life $4.4 million. 
Well, then on the first column, the efficiency goes up to 60. And on no modifiers, the efficiency goes to 15. Now, I think the efficiency of 7 or 15, anywhere along those lines, is a darn good efficiency. Even if you assume that all the buildings that we have surveyed are really nearly perfect buildings. This is a very simplified graph of, you know, if you spend a billion dollars, that's $20 million a year, in 50 years, you will save those many lives, right? And you can then have that net benefit of $28 billion or whatever your assumptions are. So even if you do a parametric study and have a range of values for these, you can still see that it is extremely beneficial for a society like the folks who are living here in Portland to do this retrofit. Here is the losses versus years. If we commit to spending a billion dollars, this is the way these losses are going to diminish with years. And hopefully, uh, you know, we're not going to get the earthquake next year. Hopefully, we're not going to get the big one, say, in four years and so on and so forth. So this would be hoping that the earthquake won't happen in the next, say, 20 or 30 or 40 years. But this shows you uh, how much gain we have every year uh, if we commit ourselves to retrofitting these buildings. Um, so here I says, let's see uh, which one of these buildings has been seismically retrofitted. This is what this gentleman is looking for, right? Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, parking structure number three, retrofitted, yeah, applause, yes, please. So we are making some good progress, um, but we've still got a long way to go. Smith Memorial, yes, indeed. Shattuck Hall, retrofitted. Science Building 2, thank you, uh, Dr. Yu for retrofitting our building there for Science Building 2. When the building is retrofitted, we get happy. So you can see smiles. Um, other buildings in Portland, retrofitted, yes. Uh, so it's not only at Portland State, but uh, throughout really Portland, you know, we are in the process of retrofitting some of these buildings, uh, which is great news for the occupants and for people. Uh, Pioneer Courthouse, retrofitted. Uh, so I'm going through these slides quickly because they're basically pictures. City Hall, retrofitted. Uh, good things, good things. This is um, the Western States Seismic Policy Council, and uh, the thing that I liked about them is we will not hold conferences in non on, on retrofitted buildings. That's their policy. <laughs> so that one actually was indeed retrofitted. Uh, other examples from other cities, you know, San Francisco Church. Um, example of retrofitting, this is the uh, dorm at Berkeley, you can, and I just want to compare these two guys. Uh, this is original design with X-bracing on the left, and uh, that one is retrofitted with X-bracing much, much, much later, right? They, they, look, they both look good, right? You know, so here's the original and here's the retrofitted. Nothing wrong with X-braces that show up. As a matter of fact, that was used, as you can see, like 60 years ago on the originally designed building. Nothing wrong with that. Freeway columns that we need to do. We, we need to these come from the state of California. Um, again, freeways, uh, bridges, and so on and so forth. And uh, Peter Dusica is going to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, again, I'm showing you some of the buildings that have been retrofitted that survived uh, earthquakes, and uh, some of the ones that were not retrofitted that did not survive. These guys unretrofitted. <laughs> All right, and the squally one, unretrofitted. Retrofitted. You can see the difference between the two. Uh, one actually standing right next to the other one. Downtown Portland. You know, we got the good, we got the bad, and we got the ugly. And this one probably is a lot. Uh, maybe it's cataloged uh, based on the ugly. Love it or leave it. I say leave it. And I always throw in a maybe because really the, somebody needs to do a more comprehensive investigation of these buildings. Uh, to see whether or not you're going to love it or leave it. Loving it means you retrofit them and you, you enjoy the building for the next 50 or 100 years, and leaving it simply means you bulldoze it down and build a new one. Of course, at Portland State, and uh, Dr. Dusica is going to talk a little bit about um, the research that has been done in the last five, six years uh, on bridges. Uh, but, you know, we do have a lot of good projects that we, uh, we conduct. There's a lot of experimental work that we do in the Star Lab or the iStar Lab, uh, they really directly relate to seismic design. So um, 
this is just a small sampling of those kinds of projects. I'm going through these things real, real fast. Um, lots and lots of projects uh, having to do with seismic design. So our policy is uh, that if we do research, we're really helping structural engineers design safer, more economical structures. Um, and that's good for everybody. And remember, killer quakes don't kill. Killer buildings kill. <laughs> and my, my, my last words to you is uh, we must prepare for disasters, natural or otherwise. Thank you very much for your attention.